Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. Prepare for a foreclosure wave coming for investors. Today, I have Melody Wright with us who essentially helps service loans to prevent foreclosures. So she has behind the scenes perspective here to answer some questions. What is a potential slow rolling foreclosure wave looks like? Is the government going to bail us out of foreclosures? Is it going to spiral out of control? Now, uh, I consider Melody a great friend. Melody, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to point out to the viewers, she does have a YouTube channel. I love your content, Melody. It is Melody Wright on YouTube. She also has a sub stack. She's been encouraging me to write. I wish I wasn't with the slow reading group, Melody, but I am with the slow reading group. Unfortunately, hooked on phonics. Did not work for me. This is Melody's Substack right here, you guys. Amazing insight. She's a great writer, great data points, very balanced opinion. So Melody, how are you today? I'm doing well, Travis. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for joining us. Um, can we uh, just, you know, just start right off the bat and can you explain to the viewers, you know, potentially what does you know future foreclosure wave look like is it just houses catching on fire and horrible headlines unemployment what does a foreclosure wave look like from maybe a you know banking you know sector standpoint <clears throat> Yeah. So I think, you know, post the GFC, it, it's very different than before. And we have to understand all of the regulatory changes after what happened, because, you know, in reality, uh, although you had this crazy cycle of origination um, th in the run up to the GFC, really, those folks weren't the ones that got their hands slapped. It was the servicers <laughs> who were actually just uh, executing their remedy under the note. <clears throat> now. And so uh, essentially what happened is when they got that slap on the wrist and no, they weren't doing things correctly, they were doing something called robo signing. Uh, that's where people were signing affidavits that didn't have personal knowledge. Um, and this was really due to these organizations being crushed under this all of a sudden, you know, uh, increased expense for foreclosure and all of these foreclosures, because we know that in the GFC, it started with the non-traditional products, the liar loans, the subprime, the Alte, the stated income, the investor loans. Like we talk about subprime, like it was, you know, somebody who had a 500 credit score was coming in trying to get a loan that could never get it. In reality, it was this investor speculation. A lot of that subprime was non-traditional products. And so, you know, you had that first wave but then by the time uh, you got to, you know, between, uh, well, really uh, like 2010, 11, 12, you started to see prime borrowers come under significant stress. And just when they needed to tap their home equity, they weren't able to because home prices were decelerating. And so, you know, personally, we're, I feel like we're in a very similar uh, setup where you've had a whole bunch of non-owner occupancy fraud through, uh, you know, doubling the usage of the FHA program since the GFC, um, but you're in a completely different regulatory environment. Uh, we saw right away the minute that we thought veterans, there were actually going to be veteran foreclosures, you know, that they went on a moratorium. That moratorium expires in May, but honestly, it takes so long to restart a foreclosure that's not even, you're not going to see increased foreclosures until after the election, uh, you know, because this is hugely political. Housing is going to be a top three issue. So I, this is long and complicated answer, Travis, but the point is, is that it won't happen like it happened before. But I do think that it we are going to start seeing, I would say, waves of foreclosure. And the first wave are going to be those that have completely already walked away. And so I can see this in my client books already when I do the delinquency reviews for my clients. You can't get any right party contact with these borrowers. What is right party contact? So there, this is a rule like that Fannie and Freddie and others have in place and the CFPB mentions it. that You have to try and speak to that actual borrower. Because if you remember back in the day, Travis, there was a lot of allegations about people calling in, 
people not, and then the people on the other side of the phone, not knowing anything about their loans, not being able to help them, requesting additional information, you know, just making the borrower's life crazy. And so you are supposed to get right party contact. You're supposed to document all of that. Well, just as what happened last time, what you're starting to see is people that are in default are not talking to their servicer at all. And, you know, some of them are, but some of them aren't. And and so, and a big part of this early portion are the investors. And then there's still the folks that are just embarrassed and they don't want to talk to their servicer because it's a very, you know, they feel a lot of shame about it. Um, they don't, they just want to ignore it as long as possible. And then there are those that learn from the last crisis that why talk to your servicer when you can file a complaint with the DOJ and, uh, you know, that'll give you a delay. And so that, I, I can tell you, we have borrowers in my client books right now that the servicer tried to contact them over a thousand times, you know, mail, email, phone, nothing. The mm -hmm. first time that my client heard from that borrower was when we got a DOJ complaint. And so okay. the system has changed radically and people understand how to use the system. A lot of people, there are so many groups out there geared and, and get government funding to keep people from going to foreclosure. Additionally, the Homeowner Assistance Fund had, was funded at $10 billion as part of one of the CARES legislation. We still have 5 billion of that left. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there are so, and then, you know, Todd, our, our friend Todd has mentioned this. I think you have too. There's these programs called the Single Family Loan Sales that HUD does um, and, and, and Fannie and Freddie where basically they sell off to, uh, investors. It's supposed to be people, minority owned businesses, things like that, nonprofits. But in reality, when you look at the money behind it, it's typically an investor and they sell those loans off and they tell them you have to put all foreclosure efforts on hold. A lot of times it could be anywhere from two to five years, depending on the program. And so there are just mm -hmm. so many things happening that make default look less, uh, less, you know, what's stark than it, it was we we are another way to put it is we can't do any historical comparisons. Like this is this environment is so different because there are so many ways to kind of kick the can that it's yeah. difficult that those that are wait looking for a true foreclosure tsunami to yes. to, to be impactful, it's just going to be very different this time. Yeah. So right. I, and you know, answer. no, no, <laughs> I, I I value your time and your perspective, Melody. I just want to let you sing. You know, it's a, 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 I appreciate it is what I'm trying to say. Now, essentially, I read what you're saying. We're not going to see the same type of foreclosure wave that we saw in the GFC as a result of more of a prime lending restriction, meaning it's harder to get a loan these days. There's uh, more guidelines these days. Uh, but in addition to that, it's, you know, the process of owning a house is so political now. They have so many programs and money to prevent people from going into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any type of, you know, wave will probably a, a lot more slowly rolled in the GFC. You're saying it's probably, and you're already noticing it's starting with investors, but let me ask you this, Melody, uh, you, you know, and challenge it a little bit uh, yeah. because you went through the GFC, the great financial crisis, like I did, you know, when we look at and I know you said don't compare. So, and I know, and we can't when we look at deficit spending, when we look at moratoriums, there is no comparison. Uh, but when we ask, you know, sometimes when, when I'm walking on the beach alone by myself and I'm just wondering about how the galaxy and universe was created and my purpose here, uh, you know, ask, how did the GFC happen? Right. And yeah, it did start with subprime. And maybe that's the wave that we don't get this time, the subprime. But like you stated, you know, in 2011, 2012, that's when the prime borrowers got hit bad because they didn't have uh, the equity. So when they needed help and they wanted to tap in to their wealth, uh, it was no longer there. So in other words, consumers stopped paying. And so right. what I'm asking, Melody, you know, despite what we have going on now, which is unprecedented deficit spending moratoriums, do you think it's possible that, you know, there is... A, a probability that we actually do see some type of foreclosure wave, whether or not the government comes in to bail the wave out, uh, you know, don't you think if, if the, the job market does crumble eventually through a recession, right? Where's this recession? That that I, could, I, don't 
cause that? Yeah, I don't even think we need the job market to crumble. I mean, increased taxes and insurance are to the point. So the answer to your question is yes, Travis. Absolutely. It's just not going to happen as quickly as everybody thinks. And I think that, and I think it is going, I think we're in a, you know, Timothy Geithner, when he uh, testified to Congress after the GFC and said, you know, HAMP was just about, it's a, it was a way to mm. foam the runway so that the banks could mitigate their losses. It wasn't about saving borrowers. And so we're, we are in a situation right now, a HAMP situation where every that you are seeing distress all over the books. I mean, FHA, which doubled since the GFC, is your subprime. And the MBS for that is 9.75% delinquent. When you add in the whole loans, it's over 10%. And that's a complicated topic. What's MBS versus home loan? Just think about MBS is your securitizations, those mortgage-backed securities. Your whole loans are just bank loans that people hold on their books. And so we're over, we're at a combined 10% delinquency on FHA, which is government-sponsored subprime. And that, and, you know, that's with them being all of these programs being bought out of the pool and rehab. They're just not going to make it. A lot of them aren't, but it's being slowed down so significantly. It's not really contributing to price discovery, which, yes. you know, I think, Travis, that's one thing you and I are really looking at. Right. And so absolutely will the waves come. They're just going to come in waves, in my opinion. I think we're going to start with this investor wave in the actual bottom of the K, folks, the really the ones that are in deep distress that can't really, you know, do anything. That investor wave is going to come from two. It's going to be people that have mortgages and people that don't actually have mortgages because they were all cash purchased. They were just leveraged elsewhere. So another place I think we're going to see a foreclosure wave that people aren't expecting is from the counties. The counties are essentially going to take a lot of these properties. When the investors walk away from these quotation mark all cash purchases, the counties, when they're not paying their taxes, they're going to take them to foreclosure. And so you're going to have mm -hmm. a combination of both investors with mortgages and then those that, that didn't have them. And the counties are going to be in severe distress. There was an, a recent article I just saw, I, can't, I don't know when it was published, that New York has come out and said that it's not going to foreclose on delinquent property taxes, which means nobody's ever going to pay those things again. But anyway, you know, that's, right. that's a whole other story. Right. But these are the things. This is the kind of manipulation we're seeing. Um, and, and so it's going to make the picture very muddy. But to your point about. Yeah. So here's how I see it playing out, because I'm not saying there won't be foreclosures, but essentially what's going to happen is just as so property taxes, insurance, they're already they're crude. I mean, they're just I have a client who just told me, you know, she just got dropped from her, you know, high net worth from her insurance in California. And she has 80 doors multifamily. And her buildings were as well. So she's got to find, I mean, this is just starting. All of these increases, you know, there's that lag effect. It takes time. But by this time next year, by June of next year, you're going to have prime borrowers defaulting yeah. right, left, and center, whether there's job loss or not. But the problem will be those investors will start the wave similar to the GFC. And when I say don't compare, you can use it as a touchstone because there are very similar things going on. It's just everybody's just so fixated on it, it, things happening exactly that way. But this is going to happen again. The investors are offloading right now. That's what you can see. Those increased sales in the market right now are people that know it's time to get out. And, but as they're doing that, we're seeing home prices start to decline, actually. Like the new home sales, that ho new home price getting down to that 400 mark when it gets starts getting below, existing is going to be like, oh my gosh, like it is time. I've got it. And that, yeah. I think that's one of the things you're seeing in the increase in inventory. So just when those prime borrowers really need to access their equity, they're not going to be able to. And so by this time oh. next year, I believe we'll have our second wave, which is going to be the prime borrowers. And Melody, on that second wave, right, the, the prime borrowers. So initially what we're what you're saying is, the investors, but that second wave, like during the GFC prime borrowers, you know, it, isn't it possible that, you know, maybe it's not going to be worse than the GFC, but I would think it's, it, it could be nearly as bad as the, oh. as bad as the GFC is because when we look at the, I don't know, what was it, 8 million people that went into forbearance during COVID, a lot of those people developed horrible spending habits. And so when it's time, when it's sure domino did. effects and when it's time to go, I kind of feel like it's possible that a lot of that forbearance help has been pulled forward. 
And a lot of those 100%. benefits have been uh-huh. exhausted. Right. Right. So exactly. They, that they have second, been. Yep. And so that second wave, I mean, it it's it's gonna be interesting to see that. And so, you know, you think 2025 it's gonna be worse. It gets worse because the, the prime borrowers. Now, how you know, how quickly there's two different types of prime borrowers is the people for the sake of argument that purchased before 2022 and right. after 2022 for the sake of argument and two different worlds, low interest rates and a hundred thousand dollars in equity for the sake of arguments. Um, you know, can you explain to the viewers the difference in foreclosure risk, Melody, uh, the difference of home ownership risk post 2022 and why that's different as far as risk pre 2022 for a minute. Can you explain that? Well, to me, you know, just because of where home prices were, uh, you know, a lot of uh, states like Florida, California, others that have, um, you know, caps on assessed values, taxing assessed values, like you're not going to have that. Uh, You're going to be taxed on that current value. And then uh, essentially the fact that insurance companies are leaving the most desirous areas like Florida, California, Colorado, because there's just such a high risk. And, you know, when you think about these insurance policies having to do replacement costs, well, replacement costs are much higher. Then you think about just where interest dropped. rate are. Yeah, you did? Well, I got non Yeah, oh. I got a non-renewal. So my insurance is really? going, yeah, I got a, I got a non-renewal. So I'm going to fi- from $1,500 to $2,500. And they gave me two months. They're like, all right, we're dropping. You're not renewing. And they stated because of the excess costs to stay in the state of Texas. And I'm like, hail damage, dude. Every, wow. Everyone on a neighborhood, I'm telling you, it's like everyone's a lottery when, it, when there's a hailstorm in Texas because the whole neighborhood gets new roofs. And now I'm paying for it, $1,000 more a year. Uh, so, yeah, I got dropped. From my Whoa, I, I didn't know that. So these these are the things like and then, OK, let's say you will find insurance. Um, you know, it's going to be more costly or it's not going. And so, you know, like in Florida, you have the government backed citizens. That's what a lot of people have had to use. You also have the, the fire government backed in California. But. But, you know, when you talk to people that actually use this insurance, they'll tell you that the, the payout rates are terrible. And so, you know, even the government backed solution is not really a solution. And then tack on the fact that a lot of people question why anybody should have subsidized insurance, um, especially folks on the water. So this is a very contentious debate and it's just going to get worse. And I often think that, you know, for those of (laughs) where we are today, the way that the government uh, kind of intercedes in the mortgage housing market, you know, it doesn't feel like we're too far away from the government essentially originating loans and, uh, you know, and, (laughs) and almost everything becoming government housing besides the super wealthy. And so, you know, and and that is not good, um, whether people, (laughs) because who gets to decide, gets to decide who gets to live where. And so like, let's take Travis, who likes to go on adventures and yes. battle sharks and get hurt and do things like that. Would we want to give Travis a house? I don't know. He's yes. a little risky. Yes, you would. So- <laughs> yeah, well, well, hear me out. Hear me out here. Uh, I'm just saying, I am a good person. To- I, yeah. I try to give back to society. Uh, I try to yeah. raise my children right. Please give me the house, uh, despite my. If it were up you know, to my, me, I yeah, would. Sure. And those are the, you know, <laughs> but that's that's the thing. When we give up control, about who and like how it's being decided to get a home. I mean, these are the things that I think a lot of people who think that socialism is a good idea or or universal basic income that they don't really take into consideration. But, Mm -hmm. you know, so, and then the other, I think the other thing, the investors, so we're also seeing distress and luxury, right? Of my 80 markets that I look at, uh, the first five listings are always these massive luxury. And we're seeing all these new stories about squatters. Um, oh, that's yeah. another thing that is going, and, and and that's happening because, you know, Travis, you and I have seen how much vacant inventory there is out there. Like nobody believes us. I mean, you can show them the drone footage. They'll see one car and think, oh, you know, that's really inhabited. But you and I have seen 
levels of vacancy that are just absolutely staggering. And the squatters I mean, are going to figure it out. It's, it is it is absolutely and bonkers. Have. I mean, but, you know, what, what I really want the viewers to understand, Melody, and, and again, help help explain this. You know, when when I, we look at homeowners pre-2022, yeah, they're getting hit with skyrocketing property taxes. I can attest that because I'm in Texas. They're paying way too much in property taxes for what they can sell their home for. Uh, homeowners insurance is skyrocketing as well. If, if you're in these affordable states, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Louisiana are getting hit hard too. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. um, they you know, are. So I understand that, but the, the thing that I'm trying to paint the picture here is how toxic the housing market is. In, in a sense, if you go to invest in a property right now, you're kind of at risk of foreclosure for maybe, say, could be seven to 10 years in that equity. You don't have that equity like you do if you purchase 2018, 2019, 2020 right. even, right? And so, you know, but the, you know, you know, the equity, right? And, and that's huge difference. And you pointed that out in the beginning of this video that, you know, people couldn't tap their equity uh, back in, in the past. And so, you know, now, you know, the difference of prime borrowers, what I'm trying to say, Melody, pre before 2022 is huge because our prime borrowers have equity. And so, you know, it may take a, a longer time because it, a lot of those people have to cash out refinance first, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're usually going to take their equity out, try to hold on to their house, take their equity out, use that money, stay afloat for as long as possible. That's what I did. And then they lose everything. So, you know, it's possible that we have multiple waves of prime yeah. Uh, foreclosures, right? Mm -hmm. Be because Agreed. we already yeah. have a, a, a portion of those prime bars who have already done cash out refinance and traded in low rate for high rate. They're done. They're GFC prime borrowers now, but, but we still have an overwhelming amount. And so my question is, is does that make the problem worse? And, and when it does, you know, spiral melody and, and we have other factors like job loss and stuff, does, doesn't this propping up and stimulus, make it worse or does it make it better? What, what are your it thoughts it on worse. that? Yeah. I mean, this is just going to be every day. So I would love, you know, I'm a very positive person and I would love to say positive things, but I keep asking everyone what is going to happen to change this scenario? What, mm -hmm. what high wage producing jobs are coming our way to make more Americans able to afford this current Weimar like inflation <laughs> that's occurring. I mean, this is just, you know, it's, I think that many of us, because especially people like you and me, Travis, who we read a lot of financial media and we, we listen to people talking about CPI and how it's only increasing this percent or that percent. But the reality is when you go to the grocery store, we know exactly what's happening when you when you want to buy Easter dinner, when you want to you know buy the Easter basket, you know candy used to be a dollar. Now it's <laughs> ten. I mean, it's just every single thing that we're doing is so much more expensive. And so, so I just feel that we. I'm oh, sorry. I, I was just going to no, say. So I think time. that sometimes mainstream media sort of makes it sound like inflation is not that big of a deal, but most Americans are absolutely getting crushed. And so if you don't have inflation disappear overnight, which Janet Yellen said that high prices did not need, you know, they weren't going anywhere. She said that. So let's say, OK, you can debate monetary inflation, whatever. Let's say high price prices don't go anywhere. They just stick where they are. And you don't have any new, like, you know, pr productive jobs with high wages that really what's, you know, service luck level, you know, service sector jobs, which aren't going to pay enough to afford these homes. What mm -hmm. could happen to change this? Well, to me, only two scenarios, essentially, you know, the UFOs come and make us tell us some new technology and we all go to work and become highly, all those people missing from the, the job, you know, from the workforce <laughs> come back. Okay. Or we go to war and we all mm. suddenly start going to start making, you know, uh, weapons or bullets or things of this nature on a certain income and financial repression comes. And they basically say, yes, you can have a house. It's government, 
owned and this is your rate. Uh-huh. I mean, there's just, so what could happen? Like what could happen to make this be less bad than the GFC? I mean, this is going to be so much worse in my opinion, because I feel like we have run out of options. Like we are just playing out the GFC. We, we stopped yes. it last time. We let wall street come in and buy up all those homes but now they're going to be tired of being landlords. They're going to be sick of it when they've got to deal with these squatters, when they're not getting returns. I mean, you know, people, that they don't want to deal with people anymore. All this fraud out there. I mean, you're hearing about, uh, you and I talked about Ken McElroy's video where he was mm-hmm. talking about just, I mean, just whole files of, you know, made up paste of, made, I mean, all this kind of stuff. The, the fraud is, and my clients have been telling me that as well is just going out of control. So the investors are going to be leaving too. They're not, this is, doesn't make sense for them anymore because they can't buy the homes for pennies. And so the remedies that we had last time aren't going to be there. And, and then you know, also to, you know, to your point, when we look at real adjusted for inflation, because we can see it at the grocery store. So like real is adjusted for inflation, which means consumers, we feel it right, has been going down since 2020. So there, there, there's not even something in place right now to afford the, you know, and to sustain this. And so, you know, a lot going on, Melody, obviously. Now, you know, at first, you know, people may have thought that you were saying it's not necessarily as bad as the GFC, but what you're saying is it's it's different than the GFC. I mean, we've notated a few things that were worse than the GFC, some things that were are currently better, which is pre-2022 prime borrowers with equity. It's a pool, there's still a pool of those people. And I would say that pool is probably bigger than the GFC. So there's that. Uh, certainly the recent homeowners are not in that same situation. And so with real wages not going up, inflation going up on affordability, you know, all these things, uh, it seems like it's. It seems like it, it could be worse than GFC, but the thing is, is because of the propping up, it's going to be longer. Where maybe as the GFC was, I don't know. You could say three to five year process yeah. of foreclosure. I mean, do you think that this has the potential to be maybe much longer? You know, four to eight years, maybe two presidential terms. I mean, how long do you see this foreclosure situation? playing out now that it's kind of the the artificial suppression of the last two years or three years is is removed. Yeah. And I think that artificial Mm -hmm. suppression was just added on to existing suppression, which, you know, you still have people in foreclosure process from the GFC just because of some of these states. Um, Yeah. I don't see this being short unless there is an exogenous event, like I just mentioned, UFOs or war. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, if we're at war, we're probably not going to be talking about home prices that much. Um, I I just <laughs> believe that this is, <laughs> I mean, it depends on what kind of war, but, uh, you know, I just no, you're believe. Not, it's scary. It's scary. And I think that, mm-hmm. you know, when I say, yeah, and just to reiterate, because there are very important yeah. lessons from the GFC and a lot of things we are, we're kind of, we're just on top of like, you know, uh, what happened then we're just kind of on top continuing to play that out. That's why it's different. And, and so, and really what's most dim- different are that the remedies have already been taken uh, in, in a way through the forbearance, through the payment deferral. And so now you're looking on the other side, you don't have those remedies and, and the government has, you know, they're coming out with a new VA program. They're always looking uh, you know, for Ginny, they luckily kind of came out where you don't have to repurchase the loan out of the pool. That's going to help servicers. Sorry, that's a lot of confusing stuff. But the idea, though, is that this could be a long time, Travis. I mean, if we don't have an exogenous event, I definitely think this could be anywhere from five to 10 years of just really abysmal, um, an abysmal housing market. Mm-hmm. It's something very, very interesting to think about. You know, I mean, it makes sense. Again, like we've been inverted prior to recession. For, I think we hit a new record. It's a two year mark. It's April Fool's today. Uh, we were inverted April 1st of 2022. We went uninverted. And then shortly after, we stayed inverted. So, you know, but the date of the original inversion, I mean, we're two years. We're, we've been inflation is, is, is all over the place. So I want to kind of end us out of here, Melody. Can you, you know, uh, 
obviously my channel is consumer based. You share a lot of inside intel with consumers. Consumers love you, Melody, uh, because of your honest, your truth, your data, your facts. Um, do you yourself, do you want to buy a house? No, I mean, you know, and even <laughs> if it's just, it's just kind of terrifying at the moment, I think. I mean, watching what's happening in with the, taxes. Say in, yeah. say, say in the future. Yeah. Say in the future and under what terms would you purchase a house? Yeah, I, you know, I think that I, I I'm going to say something crazy. I mean, I, I really have been thinking a lot about this and I think that I really, I don't want to have to take a mortgage out. I mean, I really don't. I, I just, and I know that sounds crazy and, and I'm going to get a lot of hate because people are going to be like, there's no way you can afford it. And I get it. I get it. I totally get it. I, I can't afford to buy a home. I'm not one of those folks on Fin Twit that lives in Palo Alto and, you know, has five cars or whatever. Like I can't afford to buy a home with cash. I can't do it. And, but I want to figure out a way to do it, Travis, because I think any time that you are leveraged in this, I mean, we, and I think, you know, our friend Todd says this a lot, like the house depreciates, it's the land that increases in value. And in this current economy, not just our economy, but political economy, I'm a little worried about what, I, I mean, am I going to be told, uh, you know, in a year that I can't sell my property without uh, selling it to somebody for affordable housing or, or, or it has to be 10% has to be dedicated to immigrant buyers. I'm just making stuff up. But like this is, we are seeing all kinds of crazy government intervention that I don't feel like at the moment, I would even feel like I own my property, to be honest, or own my home. And so I, I know that's, but this is just getting a little out of control. Some of these financial repression, you know, methods they're using in California and New York, for instance. And so I understand there's certain, like my state, Tennessee, I feel a lot, you know, politically like that might not happen here. Um, but it's getting a little crazy out there. And so I think yeah. that you have to, <laughs> you have to weigh those risks. And, and if you want to be a landlord, you know, get ready. These squatter stories are just unbelievable and and that's all under the law in many of those states so, so i know Melody, that's I'm, not a happy answer for people <laughs> i mean i mean i mean but what, what would you say to the people that would respond and i see it all the time they, they i share a similar sentiment or is it sediment because we're digging through the bottom of the ocean i don't know it's one of those things uh Good so i share play track. Good more play thank you you know, I'm trying to keep up uh, and I'm struggling now. As you can see, I'm treading water. Try, you know, I, I'm a worse swimmer than I am at Hooked on Phonics. You know, they would respond, you got to buy now. If you don't buy it now, the price is going to go up. Dollar is going to be devalued. It's a great hedge against inflation. If you don't buy now, you're doomed. You're foolish, blah, blah, blah. How would you respond to them? I think I've just reached a point in my life, Travis, that so, you know, I'm going to say a lot of stuff in a really short amount of time, but, you know, the GDP is 70% consumption in our in our country. And it behooves every marketer out there to try and sell us something. And as they do, they sell a lifestyle. And and you know, and I very much have learned my lesson from mm -hmm. you know believing that, being quite a useful idiot and becoming a debt slave. And I can tell you there are worse things than um not owning your home it's being a debt slave and 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 essentially selling your soul to whatever job it is that you have um to finance you know that extra tile in your bathroom um or that vacation to veil you are selling your soul and and, and essentially servitude you do not get to choose your career you don't get to choose your work you don't i mean and so that was kind of the trade-off we all made because those constraints were between, it was a small part of our lives, nine to five. Well, for those of us that were in corporate America and you know, Travis, you were, I mean, this last origination boom, none of us slept. Like you, the hours you were working were just unbelievable. It's not eight hours a day, it's your entire life. 
just so you can contend, continue to buy Starbucks, just so you can continue mm. to go on those vacations that make you miserable. Um, just so, and I know a lot of people that are house poor like this, just so you could have that extra addition and now they all regret it. And so there's way worse things in life than not owning your home right away. Uh, my opinion would be because a lot of times when you try to push forward that decision, you jeopardize home ownership in the future. So just wait a little bit, keep putting that money aside, just, you know, just do it automatically and I promise you, it's going to increase faster than you think. And by making a couple of little different choices, you will get there sooner. And believe me, I am staring down the same thing with everyone, but I would much rather be free of debt because I am then free to make choices versus having all under all of this debt where they are calling me every day. They're taking my home. They're doing, I mean, you know, and, and what we're seeing with credit card interest rates right now. That is just misery. And so those folks are, they're thinking, well, we're going to file bankruptcy. You are. And it changes your life and it changes the way that you can spend. And one thing I'm seeing in my client books is like huge increases year over year in chapter seven, not chapter 13. Mm -hmm. That should mm -hmm. tell you a lot. The difference chapter seven, you're just saying, I, I, I got to go. It's all gone. I can't do it. Chapter thir 13, you're like, let me restructure my debt. I'll make a payment every month. But this is what we're going to see. And I honestly think instead of a that this first foreclosure wave, we're going to see a bankruptcy wave. And that's going to be a lot of those investors that have these properties. Um, a trustee, yeah. the BK trustee will be. So my point is, is like there are worse things in life um, than not owning a home. And I think you and I, Travis, understand we've been in those uh, really kind of dark times <laughs> um, and have felt that so personally. Uh, and so we can say that absolutely there are worse things. And, and I honestly believe that. And, uh, and I, w I just would encourage everybody to do what I'm going to do, which is take a little, make some sacrifices, take a little more money and make it mm. a goal and work my tail off to achieve it because I, I do want it. And, and, you know, so that, that's what I would say. Well, that's music to my ears. I love how you, mentioned that we're sold a lifestyle that's how i lost everything i was sold a lifestyle i know my lifestyle led to complete financial ruin in other words you know also what you're right. saying y'all is just rebudget maybe don't go out to eat as much maybe cancel one of your 40 subscriptions it's not too late to get ahead of what is right. already here right? right in these government interventions and yes it is postponing it it may be stretching it out higher for longer we know in interest rates but that doesn't mean that there's not a storm happening behind the scenes. And that hits us deeply. Just one late payment, we're done. Our purchasing power shot. So Melody, it has been an absolute honor to speak with you today. Your wisdom and your insight is cherished. My viewers love you. I, I love you. I appreciate you, your perspective, everything you're doing. Keep doing you. And I'm going to get us out of here. Uh, and you guys, don't forget, go to her channel, Melody Wright on YouTube, Melody Wright Substack. Show her some love. Let her know that you came from Real Estate Mindset. Let her know how you know how you feel about her perspective. Great data there. And other than that, guys, if you're out there investing in real estate, you know that we wish you luck and we hope you win.